Andy, and uh, thank you for inviting me here this morning, or this afternoon now. I'm going to get more site-specific and talk about three of the sites that you will be visiting. I'm not too sure if you're visiting all of them today, but the, the first question I'd like to pose to you, has anybody thought why we're actually sitting here today? We have Thomas Bain to thank for that. Uh, Thomas Bain, who built the so-called Neisner Road through to Uniondale between 1864 and 1868 and passed through here with his gang of convicts, road builders, uh, probably about 1866, following a contour of 440 feet, above, or meters rather, above sea level, straight through. And this road that we drove up on, if you carry on with it, um, past Deep Walls is following that contour of Thomas Baines, and he in turn was probably following a game path, as he often did. So that's the, the one intercept. So we've got the north-south. The uh, other reason why we're here is because the, there's a ridge. It's called the Eisterhood Ruch, no surprise in that. And it runs roughly from 100 meters along the road in an easterly direction across a, a, a range of soft hills, which became known as the Eisterhood Ruch, probably because there were a lot of ironwoods in that area. And that's why this place is called Eisterhood Ruch. It's not really on the Ruch anymore, but it was the site of the old railway station and the sawmill and so on. But I'll come to that more later. So we're really at the point where Baines came through in the, in the mid-1860s and where the Eisterhood Ruch became important to the foresters of the 1880s. In 1880, um, a chap by the name of Mederik de Vassalot was appointed as the chief of, uh, sorry, superintendent of woods and forests for the Cape Colony, and he promptly started recruiting professional foresters to help him manage the forests. Up until then, the forests hadn't been well, well managed. They were conservators. They were rangers, forest rangers, but things got a bit out of hand with the woodcutters. And the way that they came up with the solution was to divide the forests into series or blocks. And each block would be divided into 20 sections. And these sections would be, would be rotated on an annual basis so that the one series or one block would be harvested over a 40-year period. And these were typically, I'll convert to acres or hectares, 20 to 45 hectares a section. So the blocks were quite big. Um, the idea was to create this 40-year um, rotation. And during the open season of any section, mature trees or trees that would become mature during the harvesting period for that section or windfalls or trees that were misshaped would be harvested. And so on. You'd, you'd protect the saplings to grow for the next cycle. In 1886, a very crude forest cottage existed here. I'm not exactly sure where. We think it would, would, would have been up at, it was known as the Deep Wall Forestry Cottage. In those days it was known as Deep Wall, not Deep Baller or Deep Walls. Um, and it was probably up near Adont Kop, um, which is now known as Rabbit's Adont Kop, but we'll come to that later. I've spoken about the ridge. Now, what the, the ridge did, it divided the Petrus of Bront River. Now, I think most of you know where Petrus of Bront cycle road is, or cycle path, it's behind us, or behind me, but you've got the river flowing in a direction which it comes into the Bitto River. So the, this river, the Petrus of Brunt River, flows into the Bitto and then comes down in Plettenberg Bay. And on the other side of the ridge, you've got the Deep Walls Loop, or which feeds into the, uh, what is the river called? The Rondebosch River, which is on the other side. And the ridge runs between the two, which is interesting because the ridge separates the water going into the Bitter, but any water rain falling to that side of us falls into the Steenbrus River and goes into the Neisner, into the Gauna, into the Neisner and gets into the sea at Neisner. So this is a kind of a central point for us. Not only is it the center of the Great Forest, as it was called, but it's also a watershed. Now, once the series or sections had been established, the foresters need to man needed to manage how the wood was removed. And they did this by um, surveying all the, all the sections and pegging them with survey beacons so they knew where they were. And then 
they had to get, they allowed the woodcutters in to cut down selected trees, which were marked by the foresters. But the trouble was getting the trees out without damaging the rest of the forest. The saplings were particularly vulnerable. If you damage the saplings, you wouldn't have a harvest in 40 years' time. You'd have no tr big trees. So they needed to build slip paths. And they needed to build them quickly because at that time, this is now 18, 1890, they were harvesting timber about three kilometers from here along the Odebrand pot. Oh, not the Odebrand pot, the uh, the Rug pot. So a chap by the name of Carruthers, who was an agricultural immigrant, there were immigrants to this area, um, 1880 immigrants, they were called the agricultural immigrants. This chap was one of them, by the name of James Carruthers. He approached the forester in charge here, James Cooper, and said he was quite happy to build a sawmill at the end of that road, providing the forest department built the road. And James Cooper, after a bit of uh, clever maneuvering and fancy dancing, tap work, he managed to put a, a low-cost road in, which is now known as the Eisterhoedrach Putt, and that uh, took the forest the, the access to the forest three kilometers along the line. They built a sawmill there. Um, I'm not too sure if Carruthers was representing a chap by the name of Henry Templeton, a Templeman, but um, he built the mill there. Uh, it was soon thereafter bought by Templeman, and it stayed there for about, uh, what, four or five years, six years. When those sections of forest were worked out and the forest was moved down to an intermediate position of one and a half kilometers from here, just once again along the uh, Eisthoed Rachpat, and re-erected, and that was in 1896. And uh, once again, as the sections were worked out of the forest, they built the sawmill, moved the sawmill, and put it up here. And that's why, if you do the site here, you'll be pointed to a site of a sawmill. Just across the road here, there's a clearing, and that was where there was a little village called Templeton, Templeman, and Templeman's uh, sawmill was there as well, and a store. So this, this sawmill moved through the forest as the forest got harvested. And one has to bear in mind at this time, I'm talking 1890, that this area was not quiet. It was busy. It was being harvested at enormous pace. Um, I'll give you some figures just to give you an idea. Whilst the road is now quiet, in the 1890s, you'd have ox wagons loaded with timber trundling down to Nysna. And at, at the peak, at the peak, I've got figures here from the uh, timber extracted from the forest between the period of 1889 and 1903. At its peak, in order to meet the demand for timber, 50 ox wagons were arriving out of the forest every day. Now, if you can imagine 50 ox wagons, they weren't all coming out of the Nisla forest, so some were coming out of Tetsukama and some out of the George forest, what was left of them. But 50 wagons of wagon, and a wagon was two tons of timber. So that was a lot of timber coming out of the forest in those days. Now, just briefly about Templeman. Templeman was, uh, was a South African. He wasn't born, I don't think, but he came to Nisla in 1883. He'd been here before, but he came back to Nisla in 1883, and he owned a trading store and a sawmill in Nisla. Uh, where African Bean Coffee Shop is now, that's where his, his store was, and behind it to the south was his sawmill. And he was a mayor of Nyza for three terms. So he was quite a mover and a shaker, a big businessman. And he took over the sawmill from Carruthers in 1891, and it became Templeman Sawmill. And so he would be the guy who moved it all the way down here. So that's why we call this place Templeman Station. What we have here, this, it's got many names. Templeman Station, or um, the Eistoad Ruchpat, or the deep wall station, it gets confusing. But the Templeman was the trader, was the, was the merchant. And he leads me to the next site. Uh, Templeman apparently bequeathed the yellowwood tree that we know today as the King Edward VII tree. He bequeathed it to the nation. And the nation in those days was the Cape Colonial nation. But he, um, being here, he knew of the tree. He must have owned the land to have bequeathed it. I've no record of that. But apparently he bequeathed it to the nation. Now, Coming back to the foresters, in 1894, um, the Deep Walls Stone Cottage was built. That's one of your other items in the brochure, was, is the stone cottage at Deep Walls. Now, up until the late 1880s, the Cape Colonial foresters and their families lived in rather crude and unhealthy wooden, cut, wooden huts in the, in the forests. A project was initiated by conservator David Hutchins, who was one of the chaps that uh, de Vassalot brought out with him to start building 
a number of stone cottages which had a healthy environment, had a good view of the forest, and were connected to communication lines, in other words, near roads. And uh, by 1880, James Cooper, who is now the conservative forest here, could report that the first of these three stone cottages had been completed. And these were at Buffalo's Neck, no longer standing, uh, Woodville, which I'm yet to find, and Fissant Hook, which does still stand. And those are the three very early stone cottages. By 1891, three more had been constructed and the Deep Walls Cottage had been started. Um, the foundations were put down in 1892 for a building consisting of six rooms. And there was a bit of forward thinking involved here. If you look at the stone cottage, when you get there, it has six rooms. Four rooms were used by the forester, and two rooms were used by the inspecting officer. So the, the foresters, although they might be based in Nyes or wherever, they were expected to spend their time in the forest inspecting and making sure that what was supposed to be done was happening. And they were given a bedroom, is what they called the inspector's quarters, and he was given an office, which has the fireplace. When you go there, you'll see the fireplace in the office. That cottage is still very much in its original condition. You might find the earlier forest, like the forest cottage, like at Beerflay, has less rooms. The, they moved from five to six rooms at some stage. And the cottage at Deep Wars, incidentally, is identical, possibly a mirror image, as the cottage at Ghana and the cottage at, uh, at Harkerville. They both, they are, they are off the same drawing. Just turn it around in a mirror if you want to. So there were three uh, much alike. And then this went on, and I think about nine cottages got built in the end of the day, all the way through to Vitalsbos, Storms River, Blowkrans. All these stone cottages were built, this whole stretch. This was known as the Midland Conservancy, and it stretched from George, Yonkers Hook, Yonkers Bar, all the way through to, to uh, Patel's Boss on the other side of the Storm River. A huge conservancy. The site selected for the cottage at, uh, at Deep Walls was at, uh, on the Adon Kop, which gave a wonderful view of the forest. It can see all the way through to Fussant Hook. You can see the forestry hut at Fussant Hook. If you've got good eyes, look out for the, uh, the, the uh, pine tree, uh, which grows next to the cottage. Um, but there were difficulties in finishing the cottage due to finding stonemasons, due to having to blast a hole for the water tank, and the cottage was only finished in 1894. Um, the first occupant of the cottage was Frederick Charles Rabbits, who was, a, once again, an agricultural immigrant turned forester. When the farms didn't work, he turned forester. Um, and the island became known as Rabbits Island, and the cop is Rabbits, uh, Rabbits Island Cop. The first occupants of the stone cottage was uh, our friend Frederick Rabbits, John between 1894 and 1911, John Phillips, Professor John Phillips, 1922 to 1927. He wasn't a professor then, he became a professor later. Seymour Lawton, who took over from him, and, and Holtz, Holtz Kump, who took us through to 1931 and onwards. Now I want to just jump ahead a little bit to 1937, oh, I'm sorry, 1907, when the South Western Railway was finished. Now the South Western Railway um, was a result of the discovery of diamonds um, and gold in the interior of South Africa. There was a huge demand for timber. Now to get your timber to the diamond fields and to the gold fields was a real mission because we couldn't even get across from Nyza to George where there was a way of getting through. So it was, it was terribly difficult to get timber through. So the merchants, and there were three main merchants, you know the names, um, Thiessen, uh, Parks, and Templeman. They were all big timber merchants, and they had their own sawmills. Um, Thiessen's were out at Bracken Hill with their sawmill. Templeman was down the road at Feltman's, oh, sorry, was here with his sawmill, and Parks was down at Feltman's Park with his sawmill. They agitated for a railway line, but it was motivated early on the hope that it would extend all the way through to the Long Cliff and connect with the narrow gauge railway line that comes up to Avanti. And that way they would get a route to the interior and also a route to Port Elizabeth, which was a big market for Nysna. Well, it never got any further than it was planned to go as far as, as Asa Neck. Um, that's the original, the initial stage. It never got to Asa Neck, it ended here. So the South Western Railway, which was completed and started in 2000, 1904 and finished in 1907, linked Nysna to this very point. And to the left of me, to the right of you, is the old track. The track's gone, but the sleepers, there are many sleepers still there. 
and we think what remains of the old loading platform is still there, built out of Yellowwood sleepers, no doubt. Um, the, the emphasis on the railway line came really from the rinderpest, which killed between 80 to 90 percent of all cattle and oxen. So not only did we have a problem getting the timber out, we had no oxen to draw the carts, the wagons. As I say, it was finished in 1907. It cost 75,000 million rand in today's terms, which isn't a lot of money for a railway line of 35 kilometers. It was funded 50% by the Cape government and 50% by the main merchants. It never made any money. It was a real loss leader. Uh, at the best, they could pay off a few debentures, but it was not a profitable line. And with the coming of the railway line from George to Nice in 1928, it lost its purpose. And uh, with, it survived until 1947 when the track and the, and the rolling stock was sold to uh, sugar cane companies on the Natal South Coast. Just to talk finally about the uh, naming of the big yellowwood tree. Um, the yellowwood tree, which you'll see, it's only a kilometre up the road, um, was named by a chap by the name of John Frederick Vickers Phillips. Now, John Phillips was born in Grahamstown and schooled in King Williamstown. He joined the forestry department and was based at King Williamstown, which was the center of the Eastern Conservancy, as an apprentice forester. After four years of apprentice, he got a, a, a grant to go and study at the University of Edinburgh, where he did his BSc in forestry. He was appointed here as the first research officer based in Depauls and did an awful lot of work in, in, in the determining what was what the best way to treat the forest. He was only here for five years, 1922 to 1927, and during the time he gathered a lot of information which he then put forward as his doctorate. He was awarded a doctorate in, in, uh, in forestry, and his, his uh, research field was forest ecology, and he was the first person to receive such a doctorate, and he's one of the youngest South Africans ever to get a doctorate in science. Not a PhD, but a doctorate of science. Um, he subsequently published an article on the ecological problems in the southern, in the Nisda forests called The Succession and Ecology in the Nisda region. In 1924, the British Empire Polonial Association visited South Africa, and the then President John Smuts asked John Phillips to arrange for a function for these visitors. These were parliamentarians from all the corners of the British Commonwealth at the time, uh, parliamentarians, lawyers, whatever. Um, important people. Anyway, um, he did so. John Phillips arranged for a party of about 200 people sitting around the big tree, and he chose the big tree um, because it was on an elephant path. There were, I think, 16 elephants in the region at the day, and he got his rangers to ward them off while these people sat on sawn-out logs and ate their, their meal. And he chose the big tree which he renamed the Edward VII tree, who was the King of England from 1901 to 1910. He named it after him because it was so regal. And uh, it was most memorable. To, to finish off, I'd just like to read his letter that he wrote in 1981 to his grandson. Um, he, his grandson's name was Frederick. He says, I named this large male Podocarpus falcatus, also known as the Otoniqua yellowwood, or the Op or Noprachter Gielhout, in 1924, on the occasion of the visit to South Africa of the British Empire Parliamentary Association. We arranged with Granny, that's obviously Phillips's wife, to give about 200 people lunch, chops, beef, etc. on coals. Cost nothing in those days. The forestry department provided the liquor. My staff made coffee and teas. I chose the site because it was really, really accessible. On an old, then in still use elephant trail, we made rustic seats, etc. He worked out a tale which my father gifted a gifted man with a piece of chalk put on a big slab of wood. All about the tree, its size, its sex, its age, and so on. Um, at that time, Phillips worked out the age to be 1,500 to 2,000 years. Since then, we've got a new dating system on trees, and it's come down to about 800 years. Um, and then he says, I gave a short waffle about the old tree. Um, many wrote to me from abroad later to say how unique the setting and the tale were. And he finished off by saying, about 11 elephants were in the vicinity that day. I arranged with my men to see that they did not intrude at the party. They are now said to be three only. And that's John Phillips, 1931. Thank you very much. <laughs>